I'm Justin Oliver, Deputy Chief Investment Officer. We just want to share with you our latest thoughts on the financial markets and the investment environment. So perhaps the first thing to note was that you know, the third quarter was again a quarter of recovery, both in terms of the global economy as a whole, uh, as well as financial markets. So we've outlined here the US dollar returns from a variety of asset classes, so equities, bonds, alternatives, and currencies during the third quarter. What's notable uh, is that the leaders are all assets which investors might reasonably describe as, as higher risk or high beta. Yeah, they would be expected to outperform other areas when financial markets are rewarding risk. India, China and emerging markets generally were at the forefront in terms of performance, but virtually all assets made a positive return. It's also worth highlighting that global technology stocks further extended their gains. So over the nine months for the year to date, the sector is up just under 27%. The other end of the spectrum, you know, Latin America was weak, but it's also worth highlighting just how significantly UK equities have lagged, which is both a function of continuing Brexit uncertainty, uh, as well as a sector composition of the market. Now, the UK is heavily weighted to banks and energy, and both of those areas have lagged, with the FTSE all share still down around 20% for the year to date. Also, while the quarter as a whole was generally positive, there was some weakness in evidence during September, which we think may herald further volatility in the fourth quarter. If we're looking at the investment environment as a whole, you know, there are clearly still many uncertainties. You know, we're still within the storm of the coronavirus pandemic. While it appeared that Europe had got through the worst in the summer, you know, there's been a concerning resurgence in the number of cases, with several European countries reporting record new daily infection figures. Some of the economic data which has been released has been encouraging, but we still can't be sure about some of the longer term impacts. You know, for example, there are still over 10 million continuing jobless claims in the US. And really, there's no way of telling how many of these layoffs are temporary and how many may be permanent. And finally, I think it's worth pointing out that recovery in stock markets has, has typically been more robust than we've seen in the real world economy. And that's for a variety of reasons. You know, the domination of technology stocks and the actions of central banks like the US Federal Reserve has all played a part. You know, as to is the fact that equity markets seem to have been looking past 2020 and focusing instead on 2021 and 2022 and hopefully a return to some sort of normality. You know, are equity markets being too complacent? Well, certainly some areas don't appear to leave much room for disappointment. Just looking at some of these points in a little bit more detail, you know, clearly the evolution of the coronavirus pandemic is very much depends on whether and when a vaccine is developed. I think the good news um, is that it does look like a vaccine could well be on its way. You know, there are a large number of trials on the go. 91 are at the preclinical stage. And then we've got a further 45 which have reached either phase one or phase two which is where human testing is underway. Most importantly, I think, you know, there are now 11 vaccines which are in that critical phase three period. Now that's unequivocally good news, but I think we just need to temper some of that exuberance. Certainly if a vaccine is going to be distributed next year, one of the vaccines which is currently in those phase three trials has to work. You know, there can't be a major safety concern or delay. You know, manufacturing, as and when it gets going, has to go near perfectly because we have to consider that hundreds of millions of doses are going to have to be produced and distributed. And likely that's going to be with some degree of low temperature storage requirement around it. But also, you know, getting people to take it might actually be quite a challenge. So you know, surveys have indicated that between one third and one half of Americans say that they won't be vaccinated. The good news um, is that actually when a vaccine typically reaches phase three, there's a very good chance that it will go on to approval. So 85% of vaccines for infectious diseases go on to be approved once they have reached that phase three stage. But I think most important, it has to be recognised that any vaccine isn't going to be a panacea. It's not going to be a magic bullet that returns everything to normal and certainly not the way we used to live in, in 2019. And the primary reason for that 
is it will not be 100% effective. Now, any vaccine which offers anything over 50% protection, i.e. it offers protection to one out of every two people, will be enough to get it approved. If it approaches a 67% effectiveness of the seasonal flu jab, that's going to be a tremendous achievement. We've then got the issue of how long any immunity will last. Certainly it's possible that booster shots and regular booster shots will be necessary. So netting it all out, clearly it's great news on the development of the vaccine, but again, it might not be the magic bullet which some expect and which some hope. Looking at it on the economic front, you know, the news since the summer has been encouraging, not necessarily because you know, the data has been good, but it's actually just been less bad than, than feared. And we can see that here, which plots you know, whether economic data has positively or negatively surprised. What we can say is that the global economy hasn't fared as poorly as investors were fearing, although this will need to be closely monitored given the resurgence in the number of coronavirus cases in Europe in certain parts of the US. And then, as if all that wasn't enough, we also have the US election to contend with. Now, there's a lot of noise and commentary out there, but one thought we'd perhaps like to leave you with is, does the US president actually make much difference to the performance of US assets? Now, we've shown here the annualized returns from various US assets under both the Obama and the Trump presidencies. Who has been president actually hasn't made a whole lot of difference. So when you're looking at it on an annualized basis, the US stock market delivered a return of 12.3% under Obama and 14.3% under Trump. Now, long dated US treasuries were 9.7% under Trump and 7.8% under Obama. The dollar strengthened marginally under Obama, but weakened slightly under Trump. And actually then when you look at the sectors, the best performing sectors under Obama were consumer discretionary, tech and healthcare. Under Trump, tech, consumer discretionary and healthcare. And again, under both, the worst performing sectors were financials and energy. So for all the time that we spend analysing the repercussions of the US presidential election, does it really make any difference? You know, maybe not. So to sum it all up, you know, as ever, there are positives and negatives, which we need to try to consider, and certainly when formulating our investment strategies. On the positive side of the ledger, you know, the fact that central bank support is going to remain in place for the foreseeable future is undoubtedly going to provide a tailwind for stock markets. You know, and post the US election, we're also likely to see further fiscal support, you know, certainly more fiscal spending, which is going to act as a boost to the US economy. You know, we've talked about the vaccine and how it does appear that we can expect a vaccine to begin to be available from next year. And while there's been a resurgence in the number of coronavirus cases in certain countries, this is highly unlikely to lead to the full economic lockdowns that we saw in March and April. On the downside, you know, vaccine hopes might be unrealistic. Some of the economic damage that we've seen won't be repaired quickly. And some parts of equity markets, and we could include tech within this, do appear already to have discounted a lot of good news. Meanwhile, we've got the repercussions of the US election to contend with. And actually, whoever's in the White House, you know, the relationship with China isn't necessarily going to be easy. So on the whole, uh, we think we can look to the future with a positive mindset. Yeah, but we do need to be aware of and potentially react to any dangers which will emerge. So I want to give you a, a quick update on the funds, uh, talking through their performance what's driven the returns and then take a look at the current investment uh, positioning. So the first point to highlight is that both the diversity and affinity funds are enjoying a period of very strong absolute and relative performance. So for the third quarter the diversity fund rose a further 6.7 percent outperforming our benchmark peer group which gained just under four percent. This means that for the year to date to the end of September uh, the fund is up near enough 4%, whereas the peer group is still in negative territory. Uh, we've seen some similarly strong performance from the Affinity Fund. Uh, it was up 8.4% in the quarter and 5.4% for the year to date, whereas the benchmark peer group is still 1.6% below its level of the beginning of the year. Equally pleasingly, we've outperformed in every month in the third quarter, both on the upside as well as during September when many equity markets lost ground. So the question to ask is what, what's driven the returns? 
Well, in the case of diversity and affinity, the positive drivers have been the same areas, which is basically our ESG allocation and our technology rating. So back in May, we first introduced a rating to ESG related investments. And this is likely to be the beginning of an ongoing process of greater ESG integration. And as you can see here, of the top five performing investments is the holdings of LNG battery value chain, 91 Global Environment and Impacts Environmental Market, which have led the way. This has been supplemented by our exposure to European equities, together with our long-standing exposure to technology. Now, clearly, there's a lot of debate about the technology sector at the moment and how long we can expect this segment to continue outperforming. Now, I think while the level of outperformance isn't likely to persist, or to put it another way, the easiest gains may have been delivered, we still think that technology-related investments have a tailwind behind them. You know, they offer growth in earnings and revenues in a world where growth actually isn't that easy to come by. And their business models aren't necessarily going to be negatively impacted by the further lockdowns. And that way, in the same way that, for example, leisure and hospitality stocks might be continued to suffer in that regard. The other end of the scale, the holdings which have lagged are all those which we would expect to in an environment where equities and, and risk on assets have continued to rise. So four of the five holdings here are either government or corporate bonds. And the fifth, uh, which is Hickel, is part of our alternative exposure, which we kind of expect to deliver steady, moderate gains over time. And we can view each of these holdings as, as risk diversifiers. If equity markets were to evidence significant weakness, we would expect these assets which are currently towards the, the bottom of the league table of returns to offer the funds some protection uh, and help moderate losses which might be felt elsewhere. As mentioned within the Finity, you know, the top performance drivers have been exactly the same, reflecting the consistency of approach which we try to adopt across the CGWM funds. So in terms of laggards, you know, the MAN GLG strategic bond fund again falls into that risk diversifying camp. You know, the healthcare sector hasn't kept pace with other areas of the stock market, but we do still believe actually that healthcare spending is likely to structurally increase moving forward as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. And that historically, there's a close correlation between healthcare spending and the performance of the healthcare sector. And therefore, I think it's unlikely we'll look to remove this weighting um, anytime, anytime soon. The other areas simply you know, reflect the fact that when you are ranking returns, you know, some assets will inevitably have done better than others. But I think you know, the fact that the third worst performing investment in the fund was still up over 4% in the quarter does tell its own story in that regard. In broad terms, you know, we haven't felt the need to make any meaningful changes to the fund's uh, asset allocation during the quarter. Differences here between the end of the second quarter and the end of the third primarily reflect market movements and any sort of small adjustments we have needed to make as a result of cash inflows and outflows. But when looking at the asset location, you can see we're still fully weighted towards equity markets with a focus on the US and the thematic opportunities, which I highlighted just a moment ago, with a balance invested across Japan and Asia. Alternative exposure includes a significant weighting to gold, and again, that's served us very well this year with, with gold being an asset which benefited from the sharp decline in yields across various asset classes. Clearly, as gold doesn't yield anything, uh, the opportunity cost of holding it uh, has diminished. And it's been a beneficiary of both, I think, general uncertainty and fears that certain currencies may come under pressure as a result of much heavier, heavier borrowing. And as certain countries are happy to see their currencies weaken, in order to try and boost their export competitiveness. And it's exactly the same picture with Affinity. You know, the equity exposure was just under 82% at the end of the third quarter, which is clearly a higher absolute weighting than diversity, reflecting the slightly higher risk profile that we maintain within Affinity. However, again, the positioning is the same. US and thematic equities comprise nearly two thirds of the equity exposure, with the remainder invested in Europe, Asia, and Japan once again. But there's a lower weighting to bonds, as you'd expect, and again, a significant proportion of the alternatives weighting is invested in gold. So to sum everything up, you know, both the CGWM diversity and affinity funds are enjoying a year of very strong performance, 
uh, building on the returns which we delivered in, in 2019. They remain fully weighted towards equity markets as we you know, still believe that equities can move higher given the considerable tailwinds provided by central banks and governments. In particular, we've benefited from our allocation to both ESG and technology stocks, as well as the overall exposure that we have to growth stocks. In a world where growth is still quite difficult to come by, growth assets should continue to outperform value areas. On the negative side of the ledger, clearly our bond exposure has held back returns slightly, but it's important to consider that you know, we consider both risk and return, and these areas will come into their own if and when conditions become more challenging. Had a couple of areas of underperformance, but on the whole, you know, we're very satisfied with how the third quarter and the year to date have unfolded. We're pleased that we've been able to capitalize on the trends which have been seen. 